We air five at the Patchog campus. You just got to bear with me. <laughs> um, so like Pastor Ben said, I'm Pastor Allie. And if I don't look like a familiar face, that is because I have been at the Patchog campus every Sunday pretty much since it it opened. And it has been two years since I have been here on a Sunday. And so I am so excited to be back here because this is where I have seen my mom come to the Lord. This is where my relationship was just developed with Jesus. And so it feels good to be home. Who is excited for this Sunday morning? <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to do something a little differently this Sunday. Um, if I'm ever asked to speak, usually what I end up doing is, is preaching a word. But this morning, what I really want to communicate is, is just pastoring through something and just a pastoral heart through this new year to kind of take into 2021 and just really talking just about the things that we let wear us down. The things that we let be burdens and weights in our lives. And so I want to talk to you this morning about the story of David and the story of Saul. And this is, you ever have those moments with Jesus where you just find yourself back to a biblical story time and time again, and then probably like fifth time around, at least for me, because I'm stubborn, I'm realizing, oh, wow, I should probably spend some more time here, because this is definitely a word from God. Anybody else? <laughs> just me? <laughs> so I have found myself, no joke, probably for the last eight to ten months, constantly coming back to this story of David and really what set him apart and really those beautiful moments that David was able to have with the Lord and how David's identity was so found in God. You know, before David was a king, David was a son of God and David was able to realize that and that was what ultimately equipped him to walk fully into what God had for him. And so... This morning, I want to talk about baggage. I want to talk about the baggage that King Saul gripped to so adamantly and so strongly that ultimately put distance between him and God. And then I want to talk to us about King David, who left the baggage, who dropped what was creating space in his life. And what that looked like for him was an available intimacy and freedom with the Lord. You know, I think, um, I think when we talk about, when we come into church, we hear this rhetoric of like the importance of a testimony. And while that is absolutely true and absolutely real, Jesus sets us free from things. We hear that scripture quoted all the time of, you know, we've been set free by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And while the word of our testimony is important and is vital, the word of our testimony is nothing without the blood of the lamb. And so we live in a culture that kind of glorifies our feelings, glorifies what we've been through, glorifies what we're walking through, and the weight that that carries and the weight that that burdens us with. But the reality is, is that a testimony is just a really encouraging story if it's not seen in light of the cross. If it's not seen under the redemptive work of Jesus. And so it's the blood of the lamb. It's the sacrifice that Jesus had made, has made for us that is what sets us apart, that is what gives this beautiful power and freedom in the testimony. And so this morning I'm just going to be sharing about how Saul, for Saul it was more about what he was carrying. For Saul it was more about the weight that he let define his entire life and ultimately his defense entire call and how that hindered him and how David really understood that it was all about God and all about the identity that's found in him. You know, we're going to look at these two kings and we're really going to see the, these first two kings of Israel and how they had such different heart postures, relationships with the Lord, and approaches to walking out the call of God on their life. And so if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to open it up to 1 Samuel chapter 10. And so we're going to start off with the story of Saul. And basically what has happened now in the history of Israel is that 
they weren't living with a king for quite some time. And so the people were just getting a little bit reckless. And so the people start crying out for a king, for a ruler and for a leader. And so Samuel, who is a prophet to Israel in that time, is told by the Lord that God is going to anoint and appoint a king for Israel. And Samuel is going to be the one who does that. And so Saul ends up being this first king of Israel. And what ends up happening through a series of events and a lost donkey of all things is that Samuel speaks to Saul and he says, you will be the next king of Israel. You are going to walk in this. But what I would like you to do is meet me at a certain time with all of the tribes of Israel and we are going to publicly anoint you king. And so we're going to pick up that story in 1 Samuel 10, verse 20. And it says, Then Samuel brought all of the tribes of Israel near, and the tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. And that word by Lot, essentially what it was, was this, this form of almost like holy dice to dictate what the Lord was speaking. So they would roll a certain way, and it would say, this, the Lord's hand is on this. This is the Lord's voice. Or if they rolled a different way, it would say, no, no, this is not of the Lord. And so what's happening here is God is speaking in a moment with Samuel, and he's saying, okay, now my hand is on the tribe of Benjamin. And so he brings the tribe of Benjamin near by its clans, and the clan of the Matrites was then taken by Lot. And Saul, the son of Kish, was then taken by Lot. But when they sought him, he could not be found. So they inquired again of the Lord, is there a man still to come? And the Lord said, behold, he has hidden himself among the baggage. So then the people ran and they took Saul from there. And when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. And Samuel said to all of them, do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? There is none like him among all of the people. And everyone shouted, long live the king. So in private, Samuel has now declared over Saul, you will be king of Israel. You are the chosen one. You are going to walk in this fullness. And now in public, Samuel is given that opportunity to do the same thing with Saul before all of Israel to establish this position and establish Saul as the next king, as the first king of Israel. And instead of being there and being present for his own anointing, Saul was hiding among the baggage. The scripture literally says, the Lord points out, I mean, that's savage of him. Behold, he has hidden himself among the baggage. Behold, Saul, who we are having this epic celebration for, for being the next king, has now hidden himself among the baggage. Saul was so comfortable with this public, this private anointing, but he was so uncomfortable with this public anointing. And so he chose to stay hidden as opposed to walk into the fullness of what God had for him. And he does end up being king, and he does end up doing great things for the Lord. But it is that phrase that he has hidden himself among the baggage that would actually define his kingship. Time and time again in the story of Saul, what we see is insecurity. What we see is fear. What we see is a tendency for people pleasing and a tendency to seek the honor of men over the intimacy with God. And it is that baggage that Saul carried through his kingship. You know, I think a lot of times as Christians, we can think that the baggage that we carry must mean things from the past. And while that is a very real thing, a lot of times also we can kind of pick up baggage as we go along. We can pick up things that we will add to our identity in Jesus. So right here for Saul, what we're going to see is it was God and the kingdom. God and my military exploits. God and my future is king. God and the affirmation of man. For Saul, it was always God and because he chose to hide himself and define himself by the baggage that he would carry into his kingship. And now we're going to take that same story of Saul and we're going to contrast it to this story of David. And now David, if anybody could be offended, it was David. So 
Saul ends up messing up. God says to the prophet Samuel, hey, I have a new king of Israel. It's going to come from the family of Jesse. And so David was one of the sons of Jesse. And so Samuel does this whole thing. He arrives at the house and he's looking for the next king. And it literally says that he goes through every single son, the seven sons that were present of Jesse at the moment. And every time he comes up to a son, Samuel is like, it's not this one. It's not this one. It's not this one. And so after he goes through all all of Jesse's sons that are present, Samuel looks at Jesse and he's like, hey, I know that the Lord has chosen one of your sons to be the next king, but I'm not seeing him here. And Jesse goes, oh, right, I have another son. He's out in the fields tending to the sheep right now, so let me go and grab him. David wasn't even invited to his own private anointing. And so David shows up and and Samuel has this moment where the Lord says, this is the heart of a king. I don't look on the external, I look at the heart. And so we are going to anoint David as the next king of Israel. And so David is anointed and then David heads right back out to the sheep pasture. So he's right back out to tending sheep. He goes right back out to those moments with God in the middle of the pasture where he's just crying out to the Lord. You know, these beautiful psalms that we read and that we sing. It's, that's where David just developed in the pasture and through his life, this beautiful heart to the Lord. And so... Then we come into this time of Israel where they are battling the Philistines constantly. And so what ends up happening is Saul now takes his men to go fight the Philistines. And the Philistines in this famous story of Goliath are taunting the tribes and the nation of Israel. And actually it's really interesting because what Goliath says is these are men of Saul. And so in that same story, Goliath is not identifying Israel by God. He's identifying Israel by Saul. And that's a direct, that's a leadership lesson right there. That's a direct reflection of Saul's insecurities because he had taken his own identity and he had taken his kingship and he had made it all about himself that he almost forgot about the Lord in it. And so now Goliath is saying, you are Saul's men and in comes David, who's literally just there to deliver food to his brothers who are waging war and fighting on behalf of Israel. And so we pick it up in 1 Samuel 17, verse 19. And it says, Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David rose early in the morning, and he left the sheep with a keeper and took the provisions and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment as the host was going out to the battle line, shouting the war cry. And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brother. So on one hand, we see Saul, who is hiding among the baggage. And in this scripture, we see David, who has left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage. He's leaving what the weight that he is bringing into this moment. And he's dropping it with the keeper of the baggage. Now he is running to the ranks. What that means is David is literally running to the front of the battle. David is literally running straight into the destiny and the future that God has for him. Because this moment is what will ultimately set David apart in the kingdom. It is after this moment that David will now walk into the palace and he will serve Saul. And he will go on to do many, many exploits for Saul as one of his commanders in the army. But it is the heart posture that David took in leaving the baggage and moving forward that is what sets him apart. Instead of hiding like Saul, David leaves what he was carrying from his old life. David very well could have walked into that moment still carrying bitterness from being completely left out by his dad. He could have carried shame. He could have carried embarrassment that he was the one son who wasn't fighting, that he was left in charge of the sheep. He could have carried so many different things into that moment, but what sets David apart is that he chose not to let those things identify him, not to let those things hold him down, not to let those things bear weight on his shoulders. So he leaves it. And he walks forward 
into the fullness of what God has for him. His posture is one of moving forward, while Saul's is one of cowering and holding back. And this leads me to my first point, which is that Saul lived his life from a position of works, whereas David lives his life from a position of intimacy. What we see in this story of Saul is this unwillingness to lay his baggage down. Saul would go throughout his entire kingship looking for affirmation from men, looking for affirmation from people, looking to kind of soften those insecurities. So he looked for people to soften those insecurities in him that only the Lord could address. He let people identify him. He let his kingdom identify him. He let his title identify him. When all along what the Lord wanted for Saul was to let him identify him, was to let God speak his life and his love and his worth and his joy and his hope over Saul. But Saul was so focused on what he was doing that he lost sight of who he was. Meanwhile, we have David who lives from this posture of absolute intimacy with God. This man who has found time and time and time again, crying out to God, bearing his heart to God, letting God see all the ugly stuff he didn't want. You know, he might not have wanted everyone else to see. He let God speak into his life. And from that place, David then became a man completely identified and rooted in the love of God. And because he lived his life from a place of intimacy and identity with Jesus, he was able to walk fully into what God had for him. And even though for King David, it would literally take nearly 20 years for him to walk in the fullness of what God had promised him, he was able to stay the course because he knew his identity was founded in the love of God. You know, the radical reality of the gospel is that we are already loved. We are already chosen. We are already adored by God. We say yes to Jesus. And it's not that we say yes to salvation and then we have to look really good. It's not that we say yes to Jesus and then Jesus will be disappointed in us if we don't, you know, I don't know, get angry. If, if we get angry at the person who is driving 10 miles below the speed limit in front of us, it's not like Jesus diminishes his love for us because we're experiencing anger. Jesus calls us loved. He calls us worthy. He calls us chosen as we are. And in, in, the, in our culture, we can get so uncomfortable with that. We can get so uncomfortable in living in this radical reality that we are loved as we are. Because what we want is to attach good works to it. What we want is to attach all of these parameters that will make us look better. When in reality, all God is saying is, I already love you. I've already chosen you. I've chosen you before the foundations of the earth. It is not what you do. It is just you that I love. You know, I know for me, I... I can be so works-based, unfortunately, and this is, is just a process that the Lord has been bringing me on my entire journey of salvation, where I can wake up one morning and, you know, if I wake up a little bit late or if I wake up and I don't have coffee in the next 30 minutes and I have a headache, then I'm approaching my time with Jesus not from the purest place or not from a place of contentment, but I'm, I'm trying to rush my time with God. And so instead of recognizing that God just loves me, what I'll do is I'll say, well, he must not love me because now I've done this. And now I'll have to prove that I love him throughout my day. And so then maybe I'm on my way to work and then the person right in front of me doesn't make a left turn as fast as I want them to. And then I immediately just get a little petty and I think that that then affects my standing with Jesus. I think that affects how much he loves me. Or maybe I'm a little bit short with my brother or a little bit short with my mom. And then my brain will go to, well, I, I now need to prove to God that I really do love him. Meanwhile, in those moments, Jesus isn't telling, Jesus isn't like, no, no, no. Jesus is saying, I love you. You don't have to work for my love. You don't have to work for your worth. 
You don't have to work for your identity. You are chosen. You are called. You are loved. You are my daughter, period. It is from this relationship that we get to walk out sanctification and we get to walk out this journey of refining. But you are already loved. David was able to exist in that reality. David was able to walk out his life knowing that he was loved, called, and chosen by God. Meanwhile, Saul always added these parameters to his relationship with God. It was, yes, God, I love you, but you love me as long as I'm being a good king. It was, yes, God, I love you, but you love me as long as I'm I'm being victorious in battle. Meanwhile, I, I think what God wanted to communicate with Saul was, I love you. You are chosen as you are. And that leads me to my second point, which is that our baggage can become our idol. You know, I had, I had referenced earlier, our baggage can be one of two things. It can be the things that we bring from our past, and it can also be the things that we carry into our present. And I think when it comes to things from our past, you know, I, Christine Kane has this quote that I absolutely love, and it's, We have to let what Jesus did for us be bigger than what happened to us. And I think that baggage that we carry in will will be, yes, while Jesus has set me free, I'm still going to be angry at that person and not forgive. While, yes, Jesus has set me free, I'm not going to do the uncomfortable thing of asking for forgiveness or, or asking for accountability with my friends. And so the past that we have left can become this baggage that we cling to and carry into our relationship with Jesus. And I think it can also be these things that we add on in our journey of salvation. You know, it, it can become Jesus' end. So Jesus' end, my political view. Jesus, end my works. Jesus, end my success, my money, my accolades, my degrees, my family, my marriage, my friendship, all good things. But when they are elevated above God, become idols and baggage that can ruin us. You know, God doesn't want us to elevate anything above him in our lives. He wants him to be our focus. He doesn't want us to think in this mindset of Jesus end. He wants us to think in this mindset of Jesus alone. Jesus, period. Jesus is who has set me free. It is not Jesus and my degree or Jesus and my success. It is Jesus and Jesus alone. And so it, it begs these questions of what are we talking about more what we've been through, or what the redemptive work of Jesus in our lives looks like, or what he has done for us. And leads me to my third point, which is the baggage that we carry determines the level of freedom that we'll walk in. You know, I think a lot of times what happens is that without even realizing it, we want to bring our baggage on our journey. We want to bring it and carry it along with us. And so we wear these unnecessarily heavy loads, these burdens. Meanwhile, Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus says, my yoke, the savior of the world, says my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But we want to carry these heavy loads around with us. We want to carry these Jesus and fill in the blanks with us in our journeys of salvation and our journeys with Jesus. And Jesus is saying, what I have for you is easy and what I have for you is light. Jesus never intended us for for us to carry this baggage around and be so weighed down. What Jesus has for us is fullness and freedom and a lightness, a joy. That is what Jesus has for us. And so I want to I wanna call the band up, and I want to share another part of David and Saul's stories that, to me, really reflect the freedom that these two men walked in. And what I mean by that is the lack of freedom that Saul walked in, and ultimately the abundance of freedom that David walked in. And these two stories are, are stories of repentance, And I think we throw that word out there in church and it gets a little like, ooh, repentance, what is that? 
hmm, that's going to require a lot of vulnerability. But I really have been thinking lately a lot because I think revival tarries because re repentance tarries. And I think revival tarries because what's required of us in repentance is vulnerability and discomfort and letting it all bear out before the Lord. And this coming to Jesus and just saying, I have grieved you. You alone have I hurt. And now I want to transform. I want you to carry the weight. I want you to take my burdens, Jesus. I want you to take the sin that so easily ensnares me, the weights that will just bear me down and bring me down. You know, repentance looks like laying that at the foot of the cross and saying, Jesus, what you have done is more than enough. So I'm going to lay this at your feet. So we're going to look at Saul. And like I had said earlier, what happens with Saul's story is that time and time again, Saul ends up being disobedient to God. He ends up valuing the word of men over the word of the Lord. And it kind of comes to this ultimate moment. And they're going into battle. And before the Israelites would go into any battle, they would actually make a sacrifice, which, which was their system of worship. And so what they were ultimately doing in that sacrifice was laying the future before the Lord and saying, it's yours, you're in control. And so the army is getting a little frustrated because the prophet Samuel had to be there in order for them to do the sacrifice. And so they're getting a little restless and they're saying to Saul, do we have to wait for him? Do we have to wait? And what Saul ends up doing is falling to the pressure of people. And he ends up engaging in the sacrifice and doing the sacrifice himself. And right after that happens, Samuel shows up and he says to Saul, what did you do? <laughs> you, were, you were told to wait for me. What did you do? And Samuel says in 1 Samuel 15, verse 17, though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? Right there, we see Saul's baggage. Saul was insecure, and he thought himself less than. And Samuel is saying, you are the head of the tribes of Israel. The Lord anointed you king over Israel. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And what goes on to happen in the story is, is Saul blames the people. He tells Samuel, it's the people's fault that I did this. And then Samuel kind of calls him out. And he's like, no, you are the king. You were anointed to lead them. And then so Saul then confesses to fearing the people and their opinions to Samuel. But in verse 30, Saul goes on to say, I have sinned. Yet honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel and return with me that I may bow before the Lord your God. So even when it came down to it, even when Saul was presented with his sin, instead of taking a posture of letting the baggage go, Saul takes the posture of honor me before the elders. Because Saul was so little in his own eyes, he needed the affirmation of people. He needed their honor. Meanwhile, this whole time, God is just trying to communicate to him as he's trying to communicate to us. Don't see yourself less than. See yourself as who I have called you. I have anointed you. I have called you mine. I have a future for you. But what that future entails is letting go of weight that we're not meant to carry. It's letting go of baggage. And so what ends up happening is Saul gets the kingdom removed from him. Samuel says, because you have done this and because you have valued the word of men and the honor of men over the voice of the Lord. You know, we get that, that, famous, that famous scripture of obeying God is better than sacrifice. Obedience to the Lord being better than sacrifice. And so unfortunately what happens is Saul now gets the kingdom removed. And Saul will now live out the rest of his kingship in agony in fear, 
and paranoid about who is going to take over. Not in the fullness of his calling or the fullness of what God has for him, but so focused on everyone else that he just continued to accumulate baggage. Now we're going to compare that to a similar story of David's. And David is now fully walking in his kingship, and he's, you know, doing all of these amazing things for Israel. But the scripture says in a chapter, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, that at the time when most kings go out to fight, David stays home. And what ends up happening is this ultimate sin that David does. He, he see, sleeps with his commander's wife and then murders his commander to try and cover himself up. And so adultery and murder become a part of David's story. And a few chapters later, Nathan, who is now the prophet, confronts David about it. And he confronts David with this parable. And David gets so angry at the result of the parable. And he is so upset. And Nathan says to David, that parable is about you. You are the one who has sinned. So you should be angry at yourself, David. And David's response in verse 13 is I have sinned against the Lord. And then Nathan says to David, the Lord has also put away your sin, you shall not die. David's heart cry in that moment was not, the kingdom is going to judge me for this. The people aren't going to follow me. I'm going to look like a bad Christian or a bad leader. David's cry was, I have sinned against the Lord. I have grieved the heart of God in this. His cry to God was of repentance and of sorrow. And what that shows me is that David was able, even then, to cast off the weight, to cast off the baggage that he so easily could have picked up. He was able to say no to it and turn fully to the Lord. You know, these stories of repentance, they show us the different levels of freedom that these men were ultimately able to walk in. And while Saul would live the rest of his life in fear, David would live the rest of his life in freedom and the freedom that God had for him and the fullness of what God had called him to. And so I want to ask you this morning, is your baggage hindering you from repentance? Are these things that we are holding so closely hindering you from the fullness of what God has for you? David, a murderer and an adulterer, could repent fully and be forgiven and continue to walk out his kingship and his calling because he had in intimacy, and a secret place lifestyle with the Lord. David was able to walk fully and freely in this because he knew that he was loved. He knew that he was chosen. He knew that he was adored. But before he was a king, he was a son of God. And David was able to sit in that identity, whereas Saul couldn't repent fully. When Samuel calls him out, he actually begins to play the blame game here. And then he tells Samuel to hide it so that he wouldn't look like a fool in front of others. Whereas David, the scripture actually says that after, after Nathan calls him out, David is in sackcloth and ashes. He is just on his face before the Lord. And his servants are looking at him like, what is the king of Israel doing? And David doesn't care because David is after intimacy with God. David knows that it is there in his relationship with the Lord where he will get his identity, where he will be loved, where he will be, it will be revealed to him again that he is chosen, that he is seen, and that he is adored, and he will be set free. You know, Saul was so focused on being a good king that he forgot first he was a son of God. Saul was so focused on his success and on what other people thought of him that he couldn't walk fully in the identity God had given him. You know, I think as we walk into 2021 from a wild 2020, what God is asking of us is to lay down our baggage. 
is to not let these things that we identify or add to our journey with Jesus define us anymore, not to add unnecessary weight, but to lay it at the foot of the cross. At the end of Saul's life, his life looked like a collection of baggage, a collection of affirmations, a collection of thoughts of other people about who he was and how good of a king he was. But that ultimately, that baggage that he accumulated just created distance with him and God. Meanwhile, we look at David, who just let it all go. Who in the face of sin, lays before the Lord and just says, I have grieved you and I am sorry. David, who says, I know that my identity is found in you. I know that you love me. I know that freedom is what you have for me. And so in closing, I want to ask ourselves this question. And I really believe, I know the Holy Spirit has just been working on this in my heart recently. Just asking me this question of what are you clinging to? And I think for us, a lot of times what it will look like is those things that we have now added to our salvation. My good rap sheet, how many times I volunteered, my self-righteousness, whether I'm vocal enough on social media, all of these things that I add to my salvation in order to be a good Christian. And Jesus is saying, it's not about that. It's just about me. You're good because I love you. You're worthy because I love you. It's the finished work of the cross that gives me my identity, the finished work of the cross. It is done. We are worthy. We are chosen. We are loved. We are called. We are anointed. And the baggage that we add to that will only weigh us down. And Jesus is saying this morning, let go of it. Don't let it hinder you anymore. Walk into the fullness of what I have for you. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. And that is what he wants for us.